Welcome to our seventh annual FinTech conference organized by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and our organizing partners. The Wharton School, Columbia University, the University of Cambridge, the Bank Policy Institute, and the Brookings Institution. So we have uh, a few partner, organizing partners are not here yet, but a few are already sitting in the front. So let me just introduce very quickly. Uh, so uh, Professor Andrea Kirilenko, uh, you can stand up and wave, uh, from U of Cambridge. Aaron Klein from the Brookings Institution. And Professor Patricia Moshe from Columbia University. A few more are still on their way here. So uh, I don't have to tell this group how, how the importance of FinTech and its potential impact on our life and the financial system and the economy overall. So I'd like to, on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to thank all of you. Some of them have come from far away to join us, to participate in this important discussion and to exchange ideas. Now, uh, let's get started. I am honored to introduce to you the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, Patrick Hager, who has been in this role since July 2015. And like any other Fed presidents, 12, uh, 11 other Fed presidents, throughout his tenure, his focus has been on the two important goals, price stability and maximum employment. But unlike other Fed presidents, our president, Patrick Harker, is unique in a way that we all in this room would appreciate that his interest has always lied at the intersection between technology and financial economics. Given that he has a PhD in engineering and a couple of master degrees in engineering and economics. Now, under his leadership here at Philadelphia Fed, we have been placed front and center in the Fed system in terms of technological thought leadership. And we could have hosted this wonderful FinTech conference like today without his support. Now, earlier in his career, in 1990s, he wrote a FinTech article, a research article, when he, was a PhD, uh, when he was a professor at the Wharton School. And around the same time, uh, in 1991, he was named uh, the White House Fellow, and where he served as a special assistant to the FBI director there. Later in his career, he became the youngest endowed professor in the entire Wharton School history. Now, more recently, as the Dean of the Wharton School and the President of the University of Delaware, President Harker was always looking for ways to leverage technology in order to enhance the quality of education and to broaden the educational experience for the students and the community at large. Now, outside of the Fed and his interest in financial technology, He's also a serious woodworker. So when we don't see him here at the bank, it is highly likely that he's doing some, working on some big major woodworking project at home in New Jersey. Now he's here today to open uh, the conference for us and he'll be here all day so you can, we all can talk technology with him. Uh, now I'm honored and pleased to introduce to you President Harker. Well, thank you so much, Jalapa, and good morning, everyone. I think we extended summer somehow. I don't understand the outside. But really, welcome. Welcome to this latest installment of what is quickly becoming not just one of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's premier conferences, but one of the pr premier conferences on fintech, period. So even though this is a home game for me, so to speak, I still must preface my remarks with the standard Fed disclaimer, and you know it. The views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else 
on the Federal Open Market Committee or in the Federal Reserve System. Or, as I like to put it, when you recount my remarks, if you recount my remarks, just say Pat said, don't say the Fed said. That's the rule. So we have a full house, as you heard. Uh, we have a full house here at the Philadelphia Fed with more than a thousand others joining us virtually. While this is only slightly fewer people than uh, Taylor Swift and Beyonce drew to Philadelphia, <laughs> it is an incredible number, and it speaks so much to the expanding interest, the expanding interest we have in fintech, but also to the efforts of the people who put this conference together. And with that, I've got to give a shout out, my thanks to Jalapa, who leads this effort. She is so much more than a terrific introductory speaker. Jalapa is truly the heart of this conference and a valuable source of information and contacts on a wide range of fintech topics, concerns, and approaches. She's a force of nature to get this done. She really is. I also wish to thank our panelists and speakers, several of whom I am proud to call my colleagues within the Federal Reserve System, along with the organizing partners you heard Jalapa speak of uh, just a few minutes ago. This is truly an amazing team, and a team that put this together. And of course, thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you in this room and online uh, for being here with us. Now, this is a conference to which I always look forward to uh, attending. After all, as you heard by education, I'm an engineer even more than I am an economist. So any forum that stands at the nexus of these two disciplines is enough to pique my interest. Now, as an economist, and especially as president and CEO of the Philadelphia Fed, my goal, as you heard, is to ensure a stable economy that provides opportunities, opportunities for everyone to grow and succeed. As an engineer, and specifically as a civil engineer, my goal was to ensure safe, reliable, and stable infrastructure, which provides opportunities, again, for all communities to grow and succeed. I am far from the first person to recognize this important interdisciplinary connection. In 1917, then director of the College of Engineering at Northwestern University, John Hayford, wrote an essay in the Journal of Political Economy titled, fittingly enough, The Relation of Engineering to Economics. And it contains the following. Economics and engineering are closely related. Economics has been defined as the social science of earning a living. With the same appropriateness, engineering may be defined to be physical science applied to helping groups make a better living. So if you drill down, though, be, be below the surface of this statement, it becomes clear that both economists and engineers are looking for ways to make systems stronger, more equitable, and more efficient. And we can see throughout history the advances in civil engineering, for example, which brought about both economic and societal advances. We can chart the progress from the days of sighting cities within sheltered harbors or along navigable rivers and lakes, to the digging of canals and the laying of railroad tracks, which allowed for the sighting of new cities, to the advent of the automobile and the airplane, which drastically shrunk, shrunk distances, to the creation of the microchip, which enabled the birth of the internet and e-commerce, and yes, fintech, which rendered one's location almost meaningless. While the same progress, the same pro progress can be charted to our understanding and conceptualization of money. The barter system limited transactions to those in which two parties could come to an agreement. I happen to have what you want at the moment, you have what I want. The advent of cash from calorie shells to paper notes meant that anyone who held those commodities would be in equal standing with the next person holding the same, making markets run more efficiently and fairly. But now our concept of money is changing. We no longer need to hold actual notes when, elect when electronic bank statements tell us how much is in our accounts or any number of instant payment apps on our smartphones allow us to move virtual money to practically anyone in any corner of the world, again, rendering our locations practically meaningless. Yet, and it's interesting to think about this, yet we still call a transaction made through code merely representing paper notes, a cash transaction. Likewise, our e-wallets hold credit cards that aren't cards at all, just graphical representations. And development of cryptocurrencies and stablecoin is forcing us to further rethink our relationship with and the nature and future of cash. These changes come in some ways for the better and, and, and in some ways that should raise some concerns. 
Everyone here recognizes that fintech presents not just opportunities, but also challenges, and that we will not ultimately succeed if we only focus on the former and ignore the latter. So how do we view these innovations? How do we ensure adequate understanding of their risks and benefits? And how should public policy and regulation address these as they pose both benefits and risks to consumers and to the economy at large? These are just a few of the questions swirling around the topic of fintech, which brings us to today and this conference. But the biggest question to me, the biggest question of all is not what if, but what next? This is the big question that will be in the background of every conversation over the next two days. And my hope is that these conversations will keep us moving toward an answer, the answer. We are witnessing a technological revolution through AI, which holds tremendous promise for increased productivity and allowing for more decisions to be made in real time. As an increasing number of institutions turn to AI-powered chatbots, the need for us to continue fine-tuning and securing this technology only increases. You know, our recent story in the New York Times highlighted a Las Vegas conference at which white hat hackers were asked to help uncover vulnerabilities in the safeguards of AI chatbots. And many found ways to trick these chatbots into making misleading, unethical, and potentially dangerous statements. It's not hard. It's not hard to move from this situation to one of malicious hackers exposing security flaws to exploit unsuspecting consumers at a financial institution into giving up sensitive identifying information. This is an instance where our ability to keep focused on what may be next will also ensure consumer confidence. We at the Federal Reserve, both here in Philadelphia and system-wide, are going to remain focused on doing our part. For example, July saw the rollout of the new Fed, FedNow instant payment service platform. With FedNow, we will have a more nimble and responsive banking system. Within the third district, we continue working with our banking partners to encourage their participation at FedNow. Now, certainly, the Federal Reserve is not first past the post in creating an instant payment system. Other systems, whether operated by individual banks or through third parties, have been operational for some time. But by allowing banks to interact with each other to ensure one customer's payments quickly and efficiently become another's deposit, the Federal Reserve is fulfilling its role in providing a fair and equitable payment system. Another area, another area where the Fed is providing thought leadership is quantum computing, or QC. I am especially proud that this system-wide effort is being led from right here at the Philadelphia Fed. Quantum computing has the potential to revolutionize security and problem-solving methodologies throughout the banking and financial services industry. Right now, individual institutions and other central banks globally are expanding their own research into QC. And just as these institutions look to the Fed for economic leadership, so too are they looking to us for technological leadership. QC holds tremendous promise for expanding capabilities far beyond those that our current systems allow. But we also know QC could allow for nefarious actors to pose a truly global cybersecurity threat, such as by hacking encryption algorithms. And while there has been noted progress in quantum-resistant encryption, as a banking regulator, ever-present technological change means that we cannot take our eye off the ball. These examples are why the Fed will also continue will also continue its efforts in providing leadership in areas of financial literacy and education, including the publication and materials we have made available for educators to take into their classrooms, to give consumers the tools they will need to navigate these new waters, to make smart decisions, and to ultimately protect their own futures. Thankfully, we're not alone in any of these efforts. Throughout the financial system are numerous partners, public and private sector alike, inside this room and watching online, who understand the importance of making sure we get the correct answer to the question, what next? And as it just so happens, one of these partners is the subject of our first fireside chat. Rohit Chopra, Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB. Throughout his tenure leading the CFPB and before it as a member of the Federal Trade Commission, 
Director Chopra has focused on issues of fraud prevention and economic and financial fairness. I am also honored to welcome him as he happens to be an alum of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, not too shabby, uh, which is not only one of our conference's organizing partners, but where I hung my hat as an academic and as a dean for many years prior to in my prior life as an ac in academia. And leading this discussion will be the director of the Digital Assets Policy Project at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, Tim Massa. In addition to authoring numerous articles on crypto and financial regulation, Tim served as chairman of the U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission, a tenure that brought him front and center with numerous fintech issues, and as assistant secretary for financial stability at the United States Treasury. With that, it is time to get this seventh fintech conference formally started. So, what's next? Well, this microphone is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Rohit Chopra.